to mysterious cases with unbroken ciphers. What secrets lie behind the unbroken ciphers of unsolved cases? These mysteries have haunted investigators and codebreakers for years, defying all attempts to uncover the truth. Is there a hidden message waiting to be decoded, or is it a cryptic warning from an unknown enemy? As we journey deeper into the enigmatic world of these cases, we can only hope to unlock the secrets that have remained hidden for so long. But beware, for the truth may be more shocking than we ever imagined. Join us on this journey into the unknown, as we attempt to unravel the secrets hidden within these unbroken ciphers. First, let's discuss the Tarman Shut case. It was December 1st, 1948. At the time, passers-by discovered a man's corpse on the shore of Somerton Beach in Adelaide. Australia at 6.30 a.m. Several witnesses claimed to have spotted him in the beach the previous evening, but since they believe they saw his arm shake, they assumed he could be homeless or intoxicated and continued their search. The following witness became aware of a problem the next morning and phoned the police. The body was found by the coroner to be in excellent condition. In his mid-40s with wide shoulders and a trim waist, he had a sharp suit, tie, and matching jumper, but there was no hat on his head. He had no identity and no dental records, was clean shaven, and lacked any identifiable tattoos or markings. A usable bus ticket and an unused train ticket were in his pockets, apart for three things marked Kian. All of his apparel was labeled free. A cigarette was jammed behind his ear, and another wedged between his collar and face half-smoked. Nothing was learned from the autopsy other than the coroner's suspicion that the guy may have been poisoned, albeit there was no proof of the poison's composition. The man's trouser leg has a concealed inside fob pocket that was sewed there. A little rolled up piece of paper with the words Taman Shad neatly clipped around it was concealed in this stitched pocket. Authorities were brought in to interpret the language and they determined that it meant completed and was written on the last page of a book of poetry by Omar Khayyam called the Rubaiyat. There was a global hunt for the Rubaiyat copy since experts were unsure of which book this was taken from. Police released the man's fingerprints and picture along with the tale right away, but no strong leads materialized. The Khayyam name was pursued, but neither the guy who was located nor the clothing were recognizable as belonging to the missing sailor. Due to the mysterious circumstances surrounding his death, the corpse was embalmed for the first time in Australian history in order to preserve it. In order to aid in the investigation, they also made a plaster bust of the victim. A man came forward to police, claiming that he discovered a copy of the book, The Rubaiyat, in the back seat of his vehicle, which he left unlocked on the street, missing a page. After the police had the press publish images of the Taman Shad chapter and information about the book, the book's back included a page with five lines of capital letters, the second of which was crossed off. Does this have a code? A phone number belonging to a nurse who resided 800 meters away from the scene of the man's discovery was also discovered in the book. The nurse said that during her time working at the hospital in World War II, she had previously held a copy of the Rubaiyat, but had given it to a soldier by the name of Alfred Boxall, before Alfred was discovered still alive and well, and with his copy of the Rubaiyat that still had the Taman Shad page in place. Boxall was a speculated identification for the man. For reasons of privacy, the nurse's identity was redacted from the records. It was subsequently learned that the nurse passed away in 2007 and took her knowledge with her. Since all of the original investigative files have now been lost or destroyed, her identity could never be established. A brown suitcase was recovered at the Adelaide train station around 15 days after the Summerton man was found, not far from where the man's corpse was found. There were no strange objects in the bag, but it did feature textiles produced with threads that were not available in Australia and were expressly recognized to be American in origin. The labels and the clothing in the luggage had also been removed. As to what may have occurred and what the circumstances might have been, there are several possibilities. The most prevalent and well-liked theories appear to center on espionage and cover-ups, with the belief that the guy was poisoned being the broad opinion. As if the tale was not unsettling enough already, there were more instances of fatalities that were identical. Joseph Marshall, who died from poisoning, was discovered dead on the beach three years before while holding a copy of the Rubaiyat. One kilometer south of where Marshall was discovered dead, in the town of Boxall, the nurse submitted her copy to Boxall two months later. One of the Marshall trial witnesses was discovered dead, face down in a bathtub with her wrists slashed. All those who spoke about the Summerton man were intimidated into silence, sometimes even put to death. 
The two-year-old was discovered dead in the desert close to the comatose father six months after the summoned man's corpse was located. Coincidentally, before they were to provide additional information to the police about the identity of the summoned man, they had been abducted and left in the desert. In the end, the terror was successful, and no one would divulge their knowledge. The original investigative files were lost or destroyed, and everyone who was engaged in the case has now died away. Australian authorities continue to see the matter as open. Next, we'll talk about the cryptic notes, also known as Ricky McCormick. On June 30th, 1999, a lady was traveling down a road next to Highway 367 in the vicinity of West Alton, Missouri. She looked out the window and saw a strange object in one of the cornfields. She drove up next to the cornfield and looked it over before recoiling in horror to see that she'd just come upon a man's corpse that was quite significantly decayed. The dead guy was dressed in a pair of soiled white t-shirts and lee blue trousers. The flesh on his hands had decayed to the point that his fingers had come off and were lying in the vegetation next to the corpse. Since the body's decomposition was so far along, the body's discovery location has turned into a popular place for murderers to dispose of their victims' corpses. Along the same stretch of road, in 1995, a sex worker was discovered shot to death. Ricky McCormick, age 41, was subsequently recognized by fingerprints on the corpse. Ricky had long-term heart and lung issues, was jobless, and received disability benefits, but he wasn't homeless since he resided in the greater St. Louis region. Despite not being married, he had fathered four kids throughout the course of his life. Investigators were baffled by the discovery of Ricky since he couldn't drive and lived 15 miles from the cornfield. This gave rise to a lot of rumors that Ricky could have been a murder victim. The possibility that Ricky had a brain injury added to this rumor. They couldn't be certain, however, given the advanced stage of decomposition. The major case of Squad's Marsh, Tom O'Connor said that they were considering the mysterious death as a murder. Authorities said they couldn't yet rule out if Ricky had died naturally as a result of his health conditions, but a cause of death needed to be identified. Investigators started reconstructing Ricky's final known movements while a cause of death was being identified. On June 25th, while he was taking medicine from his doctor at Forest Park Hospital in St. Louis, where he was last seen alive, Investigators looked into Ricky's past but found no indication that anybody had any animosity against him. The next day, it was revealed that neither the cause of death nor the existence of any criminal evidence could be determined by a medical examiner. Notwithstanding the strange circumstances of Ricky's death, they declared that he had passed away, naturally. Up until the FBI's announcement in March 2011 that Ricky had been killed and, even more puzzling, two encrypted messages that had been discovered in his trouser pockets, the mystery case of Ricky McCormick had been quietly ignored by the world. More than 30 lines of coded text, including a variety of characters, numerals, dashes, and parentheses, were included in the two notes. The messages may have been written up to three days previous to Ricky's death, according to authorities. Ricky's family claims that he had been writing them since he was a little child. Ricky was a high school dropout who was accused by investigators of experimenting with ciphers and codes for a significant portion of his life. We interviewed the family and they indicated he did it pretty often. According to one investigator at least, nobody really understands its significance, similar to keeping a private journal. The FBI's Cryptanalysis and Racketeering Record Section and the American Cryptogram Association both conducted thorough analysis of the notes, but neither was able to decipher them. Ricky's family had also glanced at the notes, but they were unable to understand them. The public was also urged to contact the FBI if they were aware of any further notes that Ricky had previously written. They had hoped that by stumbling upon another of his mysterious writings, it may provide background information or enable comparisons. In order to refute the assertion that Ricky had continuously penned coded messages, Ricky's family spoke out in 2012. They said they never informed the investigators he wrote in code, but rather that he sometimes scribbled down rubbish that he claimed to be authoring. They vehemently denied the assertions that the notes discovered in Ricky's pockets were written by him, leaving the puzzling case with more questions than it did answers. Frankie Sparks, his mother, called him the R word, which for all intents and purposes I cannot say on this channel. Charles McCormick, his cousin, claimed he often spoke as if he was on another planet and speculated that he could have had schizophrenia or bipolar illness. Ricky went to visit a psychiatrist and he was told that Ricky had a brick wall in his head. According to his aunt Gloria McCormick, he said Ricky resisted tearing down the barrier. He had a vivid imagination and disliked living in poverty. The family said that Ricky had a propensity for making up fantastic stories as a child and had shown strange behavior. Despite scarcely being able to read or write, he advanced from grade to grade in school. Others even said he had trouble spelling his own name. He was detained in 1992 after being accused of sexual assault, and at the same time he was being held without bail. 
His public defender wrote that she had good grounds to think he was suffering from some mental ailment or defect. The family subsequently revealed that Ricky had brought a one-way bus ticket to Orlando around two weeks earlier. He only traveled down the coast twice a year, and this was one of them. Authorities were never able to determine why Ricky went to Orlando. Some have speculated that he went there to buy marijuana. The notes discovered in Ricky's pocket are still accessible online on an FBI website. The website is dominated by ideas as a result of the hundreds of individuals who have attempted to break the code since 2011. Several other pieces of information, including addresses and driving instructions, might potentially be concealed by the notes, including car identifying numbers, gambling records, drug sales, and addresses. I will now initiate my cool outro voice. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the unknown. As we explored two mysterious cases with unbroken ciphers, while these mysteries may continue to baffle us, we hope our investigation has shed some light on the enigmatic world of code breaking and unsolved crimes. We encourage you to continue exploring and never stop seeking the truth. Even in the face of seemingly unsolved puzzles, who knows? You may be the one to crack the next unbroken cipher and uncover the secrets hidden within. Until then, keep your mind sharp and your curiosity piqued, for there are always more mysteries waiting to be unraveled.